Oh, beautiful. Thank you all for being with us today online around the world and here in person. If you'd be so kind as to share what you'd like me to talk about today, we'll go there. Pardon? Okay, thank you. Some of the things that were asked about for the people online, joy, love, oh, forgiveness, and so on, worthiness, all kinds of, a, a bit of variety, obviously. Um, and the theme, Kahil Gibran, the quote just now was is sort of, a, an acknowledgement of what love can look like in our lives. Even when people ask about, let's talk about love, it's an interesting thing because humans, you know, yes, let's, let's talk about love, a workshop about love. Oh, I did this, read me this book about love and uh, relationship. Oh my God, I'm in love. All, all these concepts of words uh, of love. And it's like, but humans are so peculiar because they're like, I want to know what love is. Great song. <clears throat> and yet they hold out a thimble. Pour it upon me, old Lord. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, download what love is. And there's this little thimble. You know, it's, that's it. I'm done. New relationship, please. And that's, that has nothing to do with, with love, real love. You know, it's, and it's impossible to talk about love. It's impossible to talk about relationships for me without wanting to go to a deeper place. Like, to get really profound. But then that's tricky. Because if I start talking about real love, then, you know, some people are like, well, I, I only know like base level romantic love, which really isn't love, but that's what they think it is. So you can leave them in the dust if you start going too far. And yet I can't not, you know, I, I'm not the type that's, you know, hang in there, man. There's someone out there for you. Um, <laughs> I can't. I can't do that at all. Um, you think about it this way. You know, religions say, many religions say, that, that God wants you to honor one day a week a Sabbath. One day a week a holy day that you dedicate. Devotionalism, which is beautiful. It doesn't mean you can't do anything that day. It's just that really bring a lot of attention to the presence of God. One day a week, right? You've heard of that. Keep the Sabbath holy and all that. So imagine that God is also saying, and I want you to pull off at least one relationship per lifetime of someone you love unconditionally. If one week, day a week you can keep a Sabbath, how about one person per lifetime that you create an absolute holy relationship with them? But keep in mind, if you say, well, you know what, that's not asking that much. I mean, in this lifetime, can you pull it off with just one person? There's a couple problems with that. One is your brain starts to immediately translate it to mean a, real, a romantic relationship. No, a holy relationship with anyone. But even if you could, there are billions of people on the planet, which would mean by default, if you can only do one per lifetime, you have to incarnate eight billion times, right? So you might want to try something a little more efficient. Maybe try to like 10 people per lifetime. Try, try, you know, just live dangerously. <laughs> and again, I'm not talking about romance. It can include a romance, but just, can you just start anywhere? Start with a spiritual teacher you respect. Start with a best friend. Start with a partner, your children. Start somewhere. And if you're like, no, man, humans, oh, they just give me the eebie-jeebies. Start with your dog, <laughs> then try a cat, then the birds in the tree outside. Start somewhere. I'm serious. Start somewhere to open up to real love, divine love. You know, you're not, we're not here just to kind of work on relations. We're back again just to kind of 
grind away to work on relationships. Everything we want in life can come to us. And I know you've heard about law of manifestation, law of attraction and all that. That's just more head stuff. Because you can manifest a new car, but if you don't like anybody, you're not doing any better. If you think it's really clever to manifest a new car, why don't you put that energy into liking someone? <laughs> Forgiving someone, you know? Instead of <laughs> car, car, yeah, car, leather seats. Oh, yeah, you know, visualize, get real visceral. How about that ass? Oh, my God. All right. I'm seeing them with a glow around them. A, a heart energy shining through them, you know, and you can grit your teeth a little, but just try it. Because the holier you become, the more your life will reflect that. The car will come to you. But at the end of this life, when they say, how'd you do? What did you accomplish? I created a car. <laughs> They're going to go, trapdoor, next incarnation. <laughs> They don't, they, they're not impressed. A car. Hey, archangels, quick. We have a human who manifested a car. No. They're just messing with you, even if that were to happen. They're just like, <laughs> let's all, all the archangels at the same time, let's pull the lever. Just to really drive it home that what a waste of time. Did you like anybody more? Did you hate less? You know, really, it's what it comes down to. And humans don't realize that love will bring you all that you want. But they, humans, because of the twistedness, we twist all these, these miraculous energies that we channel. We feel this, this inspiration to love, and we turn it into a romantic thing. Rather than, I just love. I am love. God is, I am, we are love. And this love just outpours. It just... And it spreads, man. It's just like, I don't even know what to do with it. I feel so much love. It's uh, incredible. You can still choose to treat your children differently than other children. You can still choose to have a partner. It doesn't exclude where you go, I feel one with everything, therefore I can't talk to any person because I'm just one with it. No, it's not practical. Show up, you know, and deal with your stuff and make your deposits and withdrawals that they make, pay your bills and do all the human things. It's to know the truth, but respect the illusion. But you just more and more start to realize, what am I going to pray for? A thing? A car? I'm already one with God. How could it not come to me? But the oneness with God doesn't come from manifesting a car. It's a consciousness. Well, I'm accessing my divine consciousness when I'm manifesting a car, some people would argue. That could be true, but the only way that could be true is if everyone else came before the car. Tell me 10 people today that you prayed to forgive before you start telling me about what kind of car you tried to manifest. You see? At least prove it. Who did you forgive today? You know, and again, some people, that's, they think it's a buzzkill to hear these kinds of concepts. But this is the reality, man. It's like the more I get into God's self, which can only come through forg becoming more forgiving and loving. How could you become more of God, which is love, without becoming more loving? And the tool, the primary tool to get there is forgiveness. The other tool is to stay in a state of communion with God, prayer and meditation, regularly. So communion, yes, that's part of it. But if all you do is, oh, I'm in total communion all the time, but not practice forgiveness, it's worthless. But if you practice forgiveness and neglect the prayer communion, you're still better off. Forgiveness is more important even than communion, believe it or not. I'd rather still recommend that you need both of those. But if there was one that's a priority, it's forgiveness. Because forgiveness will already bring you to communion. Okay, so practicing that, that, that concept, uh, you know, the presence of God, not talking it, not just reading about it, but practicing the presence, you know, right down to the nitty gritty, you know, practicing forgiveness. And, and I'm not saying that's always easy. Uh, you know, I mean, human beings, man, like, wow. 
there's, there's, there's a lot of challenge there. You could be starting a day going, wait, I'm going to just chill. I'm going to breathe. I'm going to just practice forgiveness, you know, and then needless to say, someone's going to call that's annoying because that's the way this all works. When you say, I want to become more forgiving, how do you think that's going to happen without them lining people up? You know, you know, like at some carnival, you know, uh, uh, you know, whether it's the toss and drop them in the water or the kissing booth, you know, I signed up for a kissing booth. Yes. And we brought all the people that most repel you, the most <laughs> repulsive people, you know, you thought you were there to make out. No, no, I'm sorry. You misunderstood. It's a carnival. <clears throat> so, you know, which like is, comes from the words carnal evil, you know, so what did you expect? So our, our relationships are not just like romantic partnerships. I have to get to a place of loving everyone. But it's interesting because where romance comes in handy is we actually, by compulsion, think that when we meet somebody, we get to kind of, we feel so high, we get to avoid the, the work we were going to do. That's secretly what we think we're doing. I met somebody that makes me forget about my problems. That's what heroin does. <laughs> That's what drinking does. Is that advisable? No. You didn't actually heal anything. You avoid it. You know what's going to happen when they stop being a drug to you, when it wears off enough, and then you get a double dose of them and a triple because you, you, you need more. That's the whole point of, a, of addiction is you're going to need more. So I need you to tell me twice today that you love me. You know, I need to tell you, you to tell me three times today that I'm the prettiest or most handsome. You know, you have to compensate. And eventually they can't, won't, don't, or whatever. And I just, yeah, we're not connecting. They're not what I thought they were, which is true, but you don't understand what you just said. <clears throat> and then you're going to trade them in for someone else. Um, when in fact, the person in our lives, because they brought up some of the words jealousy and uh, betrayal and some of the other key words that came up, and forgiveness, which is still part of this, there, the idea in a partnership is technically, technically, when God said to you, I want you to have at least one relationship, just like keep one day holy, right? When God said, as an in inspiration or something that comes to us, I want you to be in love. It didn't mean romantically. It meant, I want you to find at least one person that you'll love in this lifetime. We thought it meant a partner. That was just because moving in with somebody would be a great test of that love. Because the closer they get, the more danger there is to, for stuff to come up. Like a friend of mine said way back when I was in high school, if you ever want to lose a friend, move in with them. <clears throat> you know? <laughs> it's just the stuff all shows up. So, so be careful to no longer go into relationships, romantic partnerships, with the delusion of they're going to take away my problems. Okay? Go in going, uh-oh. We're committing to working on stuff together not avoiding stuff. It's okay. You know, and by the way, I have to really like you to commit to that. Think about that. It can't be like, well, we don't want to think about work. You know, let's just, let's just romantic, you know, let's just look good. You know, instead, you know what? I've got certain things I'm working on in this lifetime. How about you? Yeah, I'm working on certain things. Okay. Strangely enough, I really feel connected to you enough to be willing to walk through that stuff of mine with you. And the other person could say the same. They could also say, oh, no, 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 I don't want any work. No. Then I wouldn't be the right person. That doesn't mean I'm saying, let's just dive in and do nothing but work on issues. Find each other's faults. That's not at all what I'm saying. I'm talking about just, first and foremost, it means let's assume the best about each other instead of attack. Let's keep calling God in, whether we're out to eat or making love. The bottom line is, when I'm with you, my mind is asking me, my mind is asking God to show me who you really are. 
God, show me them as you see them. But the reason you're singling them out isn't because they're your soulmate forever and the only one. Just because. Felt right in the moment. I'm willing to work on life with you. But eventually, one day will happen. I swear to you, the day will come when you will have the same attitude with every being ever created. The same feeling of devotion to holiness is going to happen. You're not going to keep singling people out as being your one and only. That's only for humans that live in this separated kind of thought. And they go, well, I, I'm not separate when I have someone else. Look, there's two of us. When, go, when you hear where two or more are gathered, that didn't mean I need a prayer partner to get me a car. <laughs> two or more gathered meant two people agreeing on a holy relationship. Oh, well, then where's mine? You're st starting to think people again. It's you're going to do it with everyone. Who, do you like, who would you like to start off with? That's the way to word it. You're, you're, you're one and only. They're just first in line. Think of it that way. We're not talking about some sort of strange, polyamorous relationship with the world. We're just realizing I'm growing up. Yes, I remember a time when I thought, oh, wouldn't it be great if I find somebody to be my one and only and then not have issues? It doesn't work that way. You know, when we were little, everybody had their different games they played as little kids. You know, guys sometimes would be like, let's make a fort. Let's make a clubhouse. And then we'll never go home. We'll all just have fun and we'll live in our clubhouse. It would be like an hour later, dude, you annoy me. And that's it. <laughs> you know, it all just falls apart so quickly. That's what romance keeps doing. Because it's this, you know, kind of a facade. God is not about you know, and, and in the heavens, there must just be this like constant, like this migraine in relationship to watching human beings constantly messing up the original inspiration. Okay, I'm starting my life. I want to I wanna be born again. One of you asked about starting over. I want to start over. I want to live my life with a more spiritual integrity and intention. Okay, here I go. Well, humans are going to immediately mistranslate that whole thing. Here's what God's asking you to do. God is saying, you are my children and you keep crucifying yourselves. You keep judging yourselves, which leads to crucifixion. You have to have a judgment against you to be convicted for crucifixion, literally and figuratively. So God's saying, you judge yourselves and others and it leads you to crucifixion. Okay, I'm not going to take that away because you, you want that. You want to believe that. That's fine. What does God do? God will add, not subtract. God will say, well, okay, so you're into crucifixion. I have an idea. It's called resurrection. Because the goal is I want to get you home, which is called ascension. So God's going, uh, uh, you never left, but you think you did. So I'm going to lead you into something called the ascension. But you guys are talking crucifixion. How do I get you from crucifixion to ascension? If crucifixion comes from judgments against you and others, then resurrection must mean forgiveness. Which means here comes somebody. They move in or they become a business partner or whatever. And the clashing will eventually happen, whatever kinds of clashing it would be. Uh, you don't give me what I want. If there's a negligence or there's an overt abuse, whatever it is. This stuff's going to happen. You're not wrong for having had freaky relationships. No, when you were freaky, you created freaky. Just look at it that way. When I was a child, I thought as a child. Think of it like that. When I was, eh, you know, more addictive related, yeah, I had some addictive relationships. When I was more into partying, what did you expect? A mystic? <laughs> really? Did you really think, oh, you know what? Full-blown addiction, that always leads to meeting a mystic. I mean, really? You're passed out at the bar? You know, you're, you're like, and then what do they call it? The happy hour. You know, really? It's going to be like, you know, you, you, you wake up for long enough for that last call. Not happy hour, last call. So you wake up for that last call drink, and there was going to be this, ooh, this <laughs> glowing being of light just there to go, good morning, beloved. Wake up. 
It's, it's 2 a.m. It's last call. I want, but I want to share this drink with you. It's on me. It's, no. It's, it, you know, really? A mystic isn't going to add to your addictive behaviors. A mystic might meet you in the bar and say, there's another way. That's the kind of thing they would say. Not let's get stoned together. It would be, would you like another way? Because I'm done with this. How about you? Yes, I'm done with this. Now you have two people joining with one common intention of awakening. And that's resurrection. So God is asking you to use your relationships not to be crucified. Even though you have other issues, a flat tire, job issues, primarily it's our relationships with everything. Your relationship with your car and tire. Your relationship with your job. Everything's a relationship. So A Course in Miracles comes out, and it's interesting that it addresses not whether you should kneel or stand when you pray. It doesn't tell you meditation techniques per se. It doesn't tell you what color of aromatherapy to have around you. It really is focusing on, it's a course in miracles. But what does it say throughout the book? Relationships. You've got to make them holy. And it doesn't say miracles are when you manifest a car. The miracle is when you've decided to replace hurts, hates, wounds, grievances with peace, joy, love. And that's resurrection. So the people that have most annoyed you were the greatest opportunities for a higher resurrection. If you just mildly annoy me and I forgive you, I resurrected. Let's pretend on a 0 to 10 scale, I went from a 1 to a 2. See? But those annoying people, the really triggering people, could take you to an 8. I don't want an 8. Give me a 1. I want slow growth. I want slow growth. I want like snail mail spirituality. Just ship me by boat. You know, I want the ships to be stuck out in the bay, not being unloaded. I want everybody to be on strike, all the Teamsters. I want everything jammed up, log jam in my spiritual growth. You're allowed to do that. For me, it's kind of an interesting thing, and I don't recommend my way of doing things per se, just like each of you have your own unique. But I, I'm the type that's going to go, okay, there's a, a one. I go up a notch to a two. I'm like, okay. But when those eight opportunities are there, I'm like, oh, dang. Because I know what I'm going to do. <laughs> and this is me. And these are my conversations with God. You're kidding me. <laughs> oh, I'll meet you halfway. I'll work on it halfway, and I'll go up to a five. I'll, I'll go, forego the eight so I don't have to suffer too much. But I know me, and I'm like, oh, fine. Because I know... It's hard for me to say no to something that I know can take me to an eight. I'm not the type that goes, a three would be enough. That's just not the way my mind works. Just like when I'm doing a talk, I can't just do some gratuitous thing. So I go for it. But you're allowed, and, and that's a, a, a slight facet of free will. In this case, it's a, where you can express that and say, you know what, this is a lot I'm going to just do the best I can for now, and I'll come back to this later. You're allowed and even encouraged to do that. You don't have to go the full way if you feel you're overwhelmed. But I will say, as a child of God, you are equipped with everything you need to handle any test before you. It's impossible for God to have ever given you a test that was beyond your ability. It's not, it's not even possible. God wouldn't and couldn't do such a thing. The problem is that we sometimes forget our power. We sometimes forget that, you know, I mean, after the fact, you know, I, I probably could have done better there. Or when you're talking to a friend about their problems, you know, all you have to do, you're so lighthearted about it. It's amazing. <laughs> but when you're in it, it's, it's harder. I mean, I, you know, we've all been there. Dark night of the soul, dark night of the relationship, those moments where things turn into the down spiral of hurt and, you know, trauma and all that. So we have to make a commitment, you know, relationships are your chance for resurrection. Don't, don't think that the red rocks on a full moon banging on a drum, going through a six pack, like some of these people do, is actually your route home. 
Those are just settings, ceremonial, or ritual assistings, okay? Your relationships being healed, your relationship with the Red Rocks, your relationship with this town, your relationship with your parents, your relationship with someone five lifetimes ago, all your relations brought to healing is your resurrection. Don't talk about ascension and not talk about healing relationships. Oh, I, I, I heard. Michael, is it true? I've heard there's this herb you take. Stop talking. You're already helping me get to an eight because right now you're really, <laughs> really annoying me. God, the people that come with some, uh, some, so many things, new things. You, you know, if only you do this and, and then you're going to ascend. No, you're not. You can't ascend to higher consciousness without being in higher consciousness. And the greatest way to get to higher consciousness, forgiveness. I'll say it, love and forgiveness. Forgiveness is the expression of the love. So I can love even without forgiving in a moment if there's nothing right there before me. Just being in that state. Communion and forgiveness, those two things. Can you reside in that? Yes, as long as so-and-so doesn't call. Now you have that story in the Bible. Do not pray to God while holding a grievance. Oh, no, I don't have to think about any jerks in my life because I'm just communing with God. You were told by God, don't be coming to me while holding a grievance. Not because God doesn't like you. It's because you can't reach the highest level of communion while holding a grievance. And some of you are going to go, well, I don't have big grievances. Careful. Don't try to qualify it just because you don't have a major annoyance. Any level of, you know, like just starting today. I start the day on a... One of my cons most consistent prayers is that I call forth holy relationships with everyone I've ever known or met. I don't, my, my ex. I don't just single somebody out. I'm choosing holy relationships with everyone I've ever known or met. With all beings throughout all time. I throw that in there. So sometimes I'll say with anyone I've ever met, but then I realize, no. I'm going to also affirm holy relationships with every being ever created, every creature, every being ever created. It seems like a tall order. I'm a child of God. I can do anything I want. So I choose holy relationships with all. Now, now this is kind of funny. And then immediately an image, somebody's face, and I'm like, oh, that, oh, that was a good one. Oh, I swear this happened. Oh, and it was like... No wonder I'm your favorite, you know? <laughs> so it's like, look how instantaneously it was perfect, and I, I just did it. It was like, great. A couple minutes later, someone else popped in, and I'm like, what the hell are you doing here? And then I went, oh, snuck one in. Watch. Don't just, when you're all blissed out and the perfect image, watch, because it's fun to see those ones that slip in there when you weren't expecting it. You know, you're like, oh, I handled this one thing so well with this checkout person. They were kind of rude, but I was love, love, love. And it worked so well. And then your ex calls, and it's like, click. You know, <laughs> you know it's, it's, those are, I think, wonderful moments. So that one, the second one popped in, and I thought, well, you know, it was, but it was unexpected. <clears throat> popped in, and I went, what are you, you know? Not, re I didn't have any major reaction, but it was more like, Ran well, that's random, and was pushing it aside. Now, wait, 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 wait! Get back here! Oh, nice. So, <clears throat> forgiveness doesn't have to be like somebody who most betrayed you, most hurt you. It doesn't have to be that dramatic. Just the idea that, and please remember that book of mine called "The Book of Love and Forgiveness." In there, there's some techniques, exercises, and one of them is. Anyone at any time that pops into your mind, you don't have to go, well, let me qualify the resentment level first. They popped in. Yeah, but I like them. But they popped in. Yeah, but I don't need to forgive them. Do it anyway. What, are you going to hurt yourself? I, I, I strained my latissimus dorsi muscle forgiving somebody that I didn't have any issue. It's not going to hurt you. Just do it. Love, 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 love. And if your prayer is... Peace and love to you, great. If your prayer is the, you know, I love you, please forgive me for any stuff we've had between us. Thank you, you know. 
send them on there. Any wording you're using, just some acknowledgement, whatever was known and unknown. Remember the end, unknown. We're at peace. The peace I am, I extend to you, brother, sister. Any little statement of God's presence is replacing whatever was. Even if I liked you, great. What could hurt? God's presence fills us to a new level. Is that all making sense? So in that, technically, all my relations are my key to ascension. My relationships and the level of forgiveness and love I bring into my relationships determines how high I go today. Okay? Which means your brothers and sisters are your savior. I love Jesus, but I hate other people. See? It, it, Jesus is like, don't, don't even try that. Because there's something about me you're secretly annoyed at. You just don't think it's allowed. If you have an issue with anyone, you have an issue with everyone. I know it doesn't seem that way. I'm good with people, you know, uh, but not certain kinds of people. I'm good with God, but not humans. I love animals. It's people I hate. Any kind of thing, known and unknown, is your crucifixion. Every resentment, every annoyance is going to manifest as an issue. Be it an illness, a flat tire, a bad day. It's gonna, it has to, because there is no other. You can't, thank God, that's gone somewhere else. That thought I had, it's out there somewhere on somebody else. It doesn't work that way. Since there's no other, all we're ever doing is sending these frequencies out to the world that we are. So it never really leaves me. All of my unhealed wounds stay right here. And when people say, oh, you know, I married my father. I don't know how that happened, but I ended up marrying my father. What do you mean you don't know how that happened? That's the only way it can happen. Anybody you harbor stuff with is still here because they're you. Parts of you that are unhealed. Give thanks. I'm not saying give thanks for their hurtful style of behavior. I'm saying give thanks that they popped up because you can now release them. And when you do, remember, you're resurrecting. I mean, it is astounding if you think about it. I'm actually resurrecting. Not I wish I could. You know, it's resurrecting. When you do that, God is aware of all the work you do. Your ego is going to tell you, you don't even know if that worked. You forgave somebody. Do What does that mean? And then the next day you had a flat tire. Apparently that forgiveness didn't help you much. That's the ego working you over. What you don't know is that God itself is watching you are practicing your divinity when you forgive. When you resurrected, you were allowing your divinity to bring you back to life. See? But to do it, you had to acknowledge the divinity in someone else. Why? Because they're you. You can't say, others can just croak, I am going to resurrect here. I'm going to be a, a divine spiritual, but you can't without seeing it in them doesn't mean you have to fully see it, just affirm that it's there. And then you rise to new levels. Make sense? So think about how cool that is. When people are talking ascension and all that, just try it on for size to go, well, wait, what, what is that ascension? Well, ascension means resurrection. Well, how does a resurrection happen? It doesn't just mean surviving life's crucifixions. It's the level of forgiveness takes it all to another level. It activates and brings forward, makes active my divinity, right? So I'm changing. I'm growing to higher consciousness. God sees you activating your divinity, and you go from crucified state to resurrected state. What happened to Jesus after the resurrection? He ascended. What did that mean? Just like you and me. You will find that God itself will reach down. You can't ascend yourself. You can only uh, participate in resurrection. You can also participate in crucifying and resurrecting. The rest is not up to you. That's where God reaches down and says, I'm taking your consciousness to another level from which you can never descend again. You practiced your divinity. Now I'm going to honor your choice to be in your divine state, and I'm going to bring you into that in a more locked and loaded, prepared forever 
kind of a space. That's the truth of what happens when we practice it. The ego is going to go, yeah, but, constantly, just to make us doubt. But the reward is there. Just like there's a karmic effect of judgment and its crucifixion. And I know you think, well, what is, what is my resentment for somebody from three lifetimes ago have to do with a flat tire today? It's all connected. You don't want to try to figure it all out. Okay, well, I've got a flat tire today. I need to know what lifetime I, you know, you know, there was that time you loosened the screw on Ben-Hur's chariot, you know, and so it came full circle, flat tire today. Um, if that ever happens to you, if you ever had such an, I think it's great, it's for your amusement, that's wonderful. Should that make or break your decision to forgive? No. Some people don't even like to hear the word forgiveness. You know, they're like, there's no way. I can't listen to this guy talk because he's talking about forgiveness. And there's people that flippantly type things in and send in notes. How dare him? He doesn't know what I've been through. You're, you're being crucified still. It's all I know. And I forgive you if you know not what you do. And you're going to continue to suffer until the day where you say, no more. I've reached my limit. I'm not saying what they did is nice. I'm saying... I'm going to change the effects it has on me. Because if they harm me yesterday and I'm still living that, then technically I'm now abusing myself. So I allowed the abuser to become me. That's kind of strange. But there's a saying, you become what you hate. So I become like my abuser? There's no way. Yeah, well, that's exactly right. So if you really want to get them back, let them off the hook. You acted out something I know not from where it came, and it doesn't matter because it's done. I'm a new person. I'm done with that. Done with the behaviors, done with the patterns, done. I'm a different person now. All relationships are either karmic or gifting. And the ones that are challenging, instead of thinking, oh, that was a bad decision, that was it. No, wait, just group them together. They're karmic or they're gifting, generally speaking. When, when there's people you connect easily with and there's just a nice camaraderie and energy, you know, that's probably what you would call a gifting relationship. And then there's karmic ones, which means triggers, buttons get pushed, and so forth, right? Karmic relations. It should be obvious what those look like. Not just people you don't like, but where there's just this natural like, triggering going on. There's a karmic relationship. Okay, fine. The funny thing is, then our head goes, well, okay, so my, according to Michael, there's karmic relationships and gifting ones. I want these. Th that's not how you get them. You know, you don't sit there and do law of attraction. I want, you know, <laughs> I don't know why it is when I'm imitating an imbecile, it sounds like Richard Nixon. <laughs> you know, it's kind of weird. I just noticed I'm like, <laughs> um, anyway, <laughs> no offense. Sorry, Richard. Love you. Um, please forgive me. I love you. Thank you. Um, but, you know, this, this you, you, you don't just go, I, I want gifting. The gifting, that's all. So I'm going to do my law of attraction, gifting, gifting, relationships only. No, no, no. There's a trick. Listen, please. The only way you get gifting relationships is by healing the karmic ones. And if you've ever had a gifting or a group of gifting relationships, several in your life, guess what? You must have done the work. So stop saying you don't see the rewards of thinking ascension consciousness or resurrection consciousness. You have gifting relationships. Look at them. Well, I don't have any. Oh, then that means we haven't done something here. It's not God forgot to drop some off. You don't get to have gifting ones that aren't paid for. Sorry, that's the way we set this up. Not God. That's the way we set this up. If that's inconvenient, go home, lay on your bed face down, and scream into a pillow all about it. But when you're done, the rule's still the same. <laughs> that hasn't changed. Shh. I did this cathartic screaming. I cried and then vomited. And, and I still have to forgive. You know, yeah. So you want gifting relationships? 
there's just, there's that work to be done. Just keep practicing love and forgiveness. And here's why. Because the gifting relationships aren't actually other people that are arriving. They're reflections of your changes. Karmic relationships, how do we get those? Think about it. Just look at your own lives. Everybody here has had at least one, if not one million, karmic relationships. Where do they come from? It's very simple. If you have a or more karmic relationship, primarily it comes from unhealed wounds because the relationships are reflecting, mirroring us. So if I have a karmic relationship, I must have had some unhealed wounds. You don't like it, it's, but it's there. It's one of the reasons. Another one is holding beliefs that don't serve your higher good. Holding old beliefs. Whether it's an old belief, I, I don't deserve. Whatever, some programming. Family, you know. I don't deserve better. I, you, know, not, you know, good things just don't grow on trees. You've got to work hard. So, you know, there's, there's the unhealed wounds. There's the uh, inaccurate belief systems. There's also our tendency to project onto other people. So if I've got some stuff inside, there's a tendency we have to project onto other people, which means when I am looking at my world, some of these people are entering my space carrying my projections. Like I'm annoyed by certain kinds of people, here they come. So my projections are another reason why I'm going to find this, this um, karmic stuff coming in. Another common reason that we create karmic relationships is when we've harmed others in relationship, including when we've taken someone else's relationship. No offense, but, you know, cheating, that sort of thing. So I took some, somebody else's in a partnership, and I took that from them. With that is going to come some karmic repercussions. Are you bad? No. Do you have an opportunity to heal and forgive? Yes. But that does happen with some people. Also, trying to create a relationship out of need and want is going to unfortunately bring karmic relationships. Because when I say I want and need, I'm not saying just verbally. In my mind, when I think I need someone who, who worships me, that's not coming from the divine self. It's coming from my karmic ego self, which means I'm going to see something that reflects that. So this is how, just that's a handful of reasons why we create karmic relationships. If I were summarizing those five, it would be just unhealed wounds. It's what it always is, unhealed stuff. But breaking them down in different pieces is helpful because you might relate to one facet more than another and then be able to work on it better. So what's the solution? How do I get gifting relationships? I've got to work on the karmic ones. And not necessarily tit for tat the way I named them, but generally so. So number one, to create gifting relationships, healing old wounds. Not just partnership wounds to get better partnerships. My, whatever's coming up for me. Okay? I want to create a, you know, healthy relationship. So I've got to become healthier. Another thing I've got to do is <clears throat> forgive the karmic ones. You've got to work on the karmic ones you've had. Well, this one person did this and this person, and this person was reflecting a pattern to me. Love and forgiveness. Just why would you expect fruit and veggies or whatever to grow or flowers in your garden when you haven't taken out the weeds? It doesn't make any sense. Make room for gifting relationships. Develop a healthier self, more or less. That's third. Develop a healthier self. I want to see better relationships. Come on, people. Start being healthier relationships. And you people are going to go, we're just here to reflect you, and you haven't changed. So all I can do is create the same ones I did five years ago and eight years ago. Sure, there's some variations. I've changed a little in micro-adjustments. But for the most part, how much... You know, have I changed? If I'm still triggered by family of origin issues, if I'm still running on, you don't deserve better. You know, I remember uh, <clears throat> when I was 18-ish, uh, somewhere in there, I remember 
seeing some gal that, that, you know, looked at me and there was a certain, like, she was attracted. And I'm like, wow. And so there was this opportunity. There was no way that I could see myself introducing myself because I came from such a screwed up family and I saw myself telling me, you don't deserve that. That person has such a clean, nice energy and you don't, you see? So was I gonna be able to do that? That would have been bringing them suffering. Not because I'm bad, but because my beliefs. I'd be bringing them a load to work on. So it's like, no, no, this has to get continually cleaned. This, where does this come from? Keep working it. You become a clearer, cleaner person and you realize, oh my God, I feel healthier. Now you'll draw healthier people. Does that mean always? No, because the karmic relationships are still looking for opportunities to sneak in under the radar and reflect some potentially still unhealed stuff. So the fourth thing I would advise is recognize how to assemble gifting relationships. Assemble meaning. I would like to meet somebody that's kind of connecting well with me and it just feels like a really gifting thing. Have I done my part? Have I worked on family of origin stuff? Have I worked on forgiving karmic relationships and so on and so on? But it doesn't mean, and here they come on a pumpkin chariot, you know, whatever it is. No, so what has to happen, a lot of times, please remember this one, assemble relationships. You might start to go, you know, I dated this person, what I loved was we got along with humor. And it didn't work out, but I love that, bring that in, and that's me. I created and I got to have somebody that was playful. Then I'm going to bring this piece in. Oh, it's so nice that that person was in touch with their sensual self. I like that. That's me now. Do you see what I'm doing? Don't make it, had that, lost it, had that, lost it, because you never gain. You take these and you assemble them and take yourself higher vertically. This one showed me this. This one taught me that. This one, this, and you assemble a better you. I love the way, I saw this couple once, the da-da-da-da, and I love the way they interacted. That's now me. You own. You don't covet thy neighbor's goods. You become them. And you realize, oh my God. Now when I have a relationship of any kind, including romance, but this is also true for jobs and anything else. Now that I know what I'm lo once looking for, I've become. It just changes everything. I'm owning all this. Wow. And then this one person... We, we connected really well with spiritual stuff, brought that in. Stop thinking, had it lost it, how it had it lost it. Because then there's never actually a gain. It's horizontal. Had, lost, had, lost. It's all horizontal. Take each piece, build and build and build the new self. And remember, you can never give thanks off too often. So give thanks for the progress. Give thanks for... Yes, I know that relationship ended, but I'm really, really grateful for the ease that was there. I love that. I really loved the camaraderie that was there. You see? What happened for me personally, I would say, is in life, that's kind of how I've done things. I just, wow. The downside is once you wake up, you can't go back to sleep. And you realize, I know what it feels like to have the camaraderie, the ease, this, the sensuality, etc. I know what it feels like to have this. Now, am I able to just fall in love with a piece of something here and there? It just does, it, you know, it doesn't kind of click. The drag is, you're like, well, then I guess I'm just now going to be some celibate mystic. Because, you know, <laughs> no, 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 that's not your destiny. That's not your fate. What you realize is, I feel so complete, but is it possible to create other people that are, they have that same intention, even if they're not perfectly complete, do they still set that as their, their goal, their intention? And share, because you're not looking for the one and only forever, it's, you're looking to share. Remember. Human beings call it making love when you have intimate encounter. 
Making love means manufacturing love, and that's not what you're supposed to be doing. Technically, making love, is a, it's a lie. It means we don't know how to feel and share love, so we'll make it. I know that's not what everybody means by it, because we all have used the term, and I've, I use it, you know, making love. It's a beautiful term. But I know that that's still a human foible, a little human kind of a weird twist. I like the concept of sharing love. And sharing love is done with different people in different ways. Sharing love can be a smile. Sharing love could be making love. It could be parenting love to children. Whatever it is, it, the love never changes. Just the form changes. How you bring the, the, the form of love to your employees that you should be loving, not laboring over like, oh, these people, you know, loving them. How can I bring this love? That's what's going to matter at the end of the day. How much love did you become while you were on earth? That's what determines on the other side what happens next. How much love, not how many people did you fall in love with, not how many people did you make it with, it's how much love did you become? And if I go, well, I would have, but that one took this and that one took this, back you go. And they'll make sure you have several partnerships next time because you got so many backlogged to work on. <laughs> you know, it's like... <laughs> Listen, you got a line of people that are waiting for some work with you and, you know, and eventually it's like all my relationships are holy to be able to say that all my, which means this, instead of coming in and assigning jobs for you, be, be my shoulder rubber, you know, wife or husband, be my, you supply the money and the, I need you to, it's, even if you don't, I love you. Even if we never meet, I love you. You see? The love doesn't change. As I'm closing now, I'm not implying that that's easy. That it's always easy. When you're really in the groove, it, it is kind of easy. It's kind of cool. But there are moments when people really trigger, when people are very challenging. You know, it's, it's not always easy to just walk this perfectly, you know, this perfect equal state of consciousness of constant love. It's not always easy. You can do it, and then someone passes away, and you miss them, and it hurts. And then you're going to judge yourself for not hanging into that mystic consciousness. But you need to bounce back and resurrect. Some people that have passed away in our lives, we actually have to forgive ourselves for judging them, for being angry that they left. But they're the ones who died, man. I would never hold grievance against someone. Yes, you do. They left. You think they're gone. You know, it's, we do. We hold grievances over people. You have more grievances against people that have left you than the ones you left. You know why? Because they left you. <laughs> they're the ones who pulled the plug. You'd be like, if just one more day, I would have pulled the plug. So you're mad that you weren't in control. I mean, it's kind of weird. Just see through it all and learn to laugh at it. We're here to experience the truth of who we are and petty entanglements and petty, the way we make relationships into these petty expressions, it's just silly, you know. I'm ready to go to a higher place. That's my life. That's my, any of us. That's my affirmation. That's my intention. I'm ready to go to higher places. And you'll leave this place going, wow, wow, I get it. Love, total love. And then you get triggered. Maybe before you leave the parking lot. <clears throat> you know. It's just, you know, it happens. But this, how quickly do you forgive yourself and kind of laugh at it? Wow, that was kind of weird, man. I was like blissing out and then lo and behold, you know. I looked at my beloved brothers and sisters and said, hey, listen, I would like to, to share the love I'm feeling. Would the, would the six or eight of you, you know, that are hanging out outside, would you guys like to go get a bite? See, now, for me personally, that would be, you know, a huge thing because I don't get to do that very often. So, hey, would you guys like to go? And then just one of you brings up some organic store in town that you go eat at. I'm going to be like, no, you know, <laughs> triggered immediately. I was blissing out. I was talking dominoes, and you're bringing up some vegan place, you know? And then I'm like, no, how about, and you're like, oh, 
you know, oh, you eat grain. You know, so now I'm triggered again and I got to go and never mind. And then say to myself, don't ever ask people out to eat. Don't ever go, you know, you know, <clears throat> you're going to go through the stuff. Your job is how quickly do you bounce back? That doesn't mean I have to go to your organic place, but it might. What it means is I won't judge you for your strange addiction to organic food. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't resist. Um, I love love. I do. I love love. And I love, if somebody is a loving vegan, a loving no gluten, a loving whatever, I love love. And I love to see people that love what they do. I just bliss out on it. Um, we were talking recently uh, when we had a, a, a meeting. One of the times we've had our meetings, our board members, we went out and we go to one of the places in town and we sit and we cover business and that sort of thing. And there's this really sweet person. Hi, Hannah. Um, she's on, you know, she's, she's our server usually. And the last time we were there, I said, you're beautiful. You're like beautiful, but you physically are beautiful, but you have such an amazing energy about you. I won't tell you where she works because I, I don't, you know, I don't want people going there and telling her all that over and over. But um, if I thought it was the right thing, I would, I would do it. But um, without her permission, I won't. It's a restaurant that's that end of town. Um, <laughs> that's all I'm going to say. It's on this side of the highway, and it's further down that way. So you just hit, hit them all, and you'll get there. But I was, you know, such a sweet person. And I know she told me once that she's seen our program. She's, oh, I, I know. I saw you there or before. Oh, but it was amazing because I was like, you have such a beautiful energy. And then I said, where did you grow up? I was curious, like, what, what brought this about? And she said, I grew up in Sedona since she was little. Wow, and I'm like, well, you don't hear that very often. No. Grew up in Sedona. Then I said, you know, and what were your parents like? She said, amazing, loving, healthy people. I'm like, wow. See, it doesn't happen by accident. This is a good soul who created good parents, who created a right place to grow up. That doesn't mean you and I are wrong for not having such a blissful experience, but it does mean you can have that. All right? Um, and I think she's single, so guys, if you're interested. Uh, <laughs> no. Sorry, Hannah. Um, but mentioning her is a statement about you and I, meaning we have goodness in us that we can nurture. Create better. Well, I can't because my parents weren't very nice, right? But any woman in your life that is a nurturer is your mother. Any man that is whatever is your father. You know, in other words, don't, don't just leave it off because it failed somewhere. Let someone else be a nurturer to you. Start with God being your father and mother. But also, you are my brothers and sisters. Even if I had a brother or sister that was cruel to me, done. Love you. Peace be with you. Done with the karmic stuff. Now let me bring in new brothers and sisters. And it changes. If I had a brother who never kept my confidences, my, my personal stuff, shared it with other people, do I have to keep doing that? No. Love, forgive, peace, bye. And then start giving thanks for the kinds of brothers you bring into your life who actually have the integrity. Create it. Assemble it. Give thanks for it. I hope I've covered most of your comments here, your questions here. All right. Let's take a few centering breaths. Mother, Holy Spirit of God, we're asking you to bless this meditation, this process. You guide this and all things we do. You guide this. You show us what we're to see or know, feel or experience.
we allow, we give permission to the Divine Mother to help us make this the highest, deepest experience possible. So in this moment, allow her to decide, because she's part of us. It's not someone outside. She's part of us and she knows us best. Allow her to decide the image of a person that was exceedingly challenging in this lifetime. It could be the most challenging person ever. It could be just challenging romantically. It could be family challenge. Who do we need to work on? Let them come to mind. Don't worry about it. Don't judge it. Don't get into the head stuff. Just there they are. Name in your mind just a few words that describe that energy, that negativity. Whether it was they were selfish, they were hurtful, whatever it is. Just name it in a few. Don't worry about it being judgmental. Just do it. It's already there anyway. What kinds of things? It's not an accident they're popping in. I don't care you already did work on them. Just if they're there, they're there. Those few words that describe them. And the next step. Come up with a couple words that describe you. What in you would have drawn a person like that? I'm not saying you're bad, but what kind, a couple of words, what kinds of characteristics, belief systems, patterns did I have that would have even brought somebody like that into my life? It could be repressed hurt. It could be passive aggressive behavior. It could be I'm, I was too passive. It could be low self-worth. Allow it. Be honest. Let the Holy Spirit say, sweetheart, you're not judged with this, but at that time, you are here to work on what? And see if you can go to the next level with this by doing this. Can you say, oh, that makes total sense. That if I had a lesson around a, B, and C, that I would have someone in my life with X, Y, and Z. It makes sense. It makes sense that someone was the type that took my power away when I wasn't owning it enough. It makes sense. I get it. It makes sense. And not only am I beyond that now and or moving beyond that now I'm going to use this to launch me into resurrection to you my brother or sister whatever role they played in this life mom dad person that's still it's a brother or sister on this planet to you the things we experience the things that were experienced between us did not feel good. It felt like you were being hurtful, selfish. But I understand that I played a part somehow. Not overtly asking for this, but just somehow there was a lesson. Whatever that lesson was and is, I'm asking you, Mother, to help me anchor that in my being. So I'm giving you, Holy Spirit, the soul of this person. They are not condemned in my mind. That which was karmic, I'm choosing to give to you, Mother. This is a brother-sister that was strained between the two of us, and I want them to be brought to the light. They deserve it as much as I. 
I don't know all the nuances about them and I don't care. That's not my business. I'm just giving them unconditionally to you, Mother. Make believe or imagine for just a moment if you gave that person's soul to the Holy Spirit, how do they feel? Just try to even remotely imagine how grateful they feel to be in a state of love instead of the pain that they were in. And then imagine the gratitude they feel as they stand in the light of the mother and the gratitude of the mother that you brought one of her children home today. And the gratitude of the person wells up and grows so bright that it shines into your own being. The mother, you are my beloved child in whom I am so proud. I am so pleased. You surrendered one of my lost children. You gave them back to me instead of trying to hold your own opinions. You asked for mine. How could I not include you in this? You are lifted. You are resurrected. You are brought out of the tomb. You're brought out of the grave. You're brought out of the karmic relationship. Lifted. I feel alive. Choose to feel alive. Choose to feel free. No obsessing on the past right now. I feel free. <sighs> Home. Two or more gathered with one intention to go home. Thank you, brother and sister. Thank you, Holy Spirit, Divine Mother. Thank you to myself for manifesting this conversation today no accident or coincidence about it. Hmm. And so it is. Take a nice deep breath or two in. Just the peace that I was feeling, let it anchor into every cell. Let every neuron absorb some of it. Let every cell, every feeling, just permanent absorption. And that's ascension. I am different. I've gone to a higher level now. That's ascension. A few just relaxing breaths and decompress. Back to the room. Stretch out if you'd like. Thank you for your courage to manifest this conversation. Um, what was shared, you know, some people are, I know, tempted to go, I really could have done without thinking of that other person, you know, or <laughs> karmic, I, I just only wanted to feel all happy and skip through the room. Um, your level to go to that place is gonna be contingent on your level to get what we just covered, okay? It's okay. Absorb this, it'll take you higher now. Just allow that to happen. We're going to take, take up our collection and do our closing prayer. Just be as generous as you can be, please. Online, they can click a button to make donations, but also here, there's the um, purple bags. Those are for your love offerings for the Sundays. And just do what you can, but also the baskets are for any extra donations. Those are, we use for people of lesser means or special projects. Project at hand is, and it's quite expensive. It's, you know, 10 grand plus. I think it's even 10 to 15. The carpet's gonna get replaced. Um, and there's a couple other things we're gonna be doing. So um, if you can be so kind, if you have the means, give towards that. Or just give a little bit towards that, whatever you can do. That would go in the baskets or you can set it in during the week for that matter. Email it in, okay? Please hold your love offering to your heart with full love, full intention, 
full focus. Mm. Together, please. Divine love flowing through me blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. And so it is. Thank you so much. Can anyone share what they learned or heard today that made the most sense or that was the most important for you to have heard or shared, even in the meditation for that matter? Yes. Assemble. Assemble. Yes. Nice, huh? Yeah, put it together. P pieces, you know, let it stack up. Yes. Yes, good question. Yeah. Can a relationship be both karmic and gifting? Yes, okay. because the karmic ones can become gifting ones, first of all, in themselves. Sometimes they just are a mixture of the two. They're not exclusively karmic, exclusively, because even a gifting one could trigger a little bit. But just generally speaking, you can tell generally what ones were more leaning towards challenging karmic relationships. And which ones were really like, you, you know, when you feel grateful someone's in your life, that's a good sign that it's a gifting relationship. Yes. Forgiveness can lead to communion. It's, it launches you that direction. Forgiveness is the most important piece to it all. Communion's great, but nothing will launch you into that faster than forgiveness and more thoroughly. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you pray to God, you want God's blessing, and you, you know, try holding out more than a thimble. I mean, you know, come on, let's go. Yes. Love itself never changes, just the form does. Love itself never changes, this the form does. So I can feel love for all, but it can change a little between a student, um, a, a, a friend, a family member. The, the form might change or be altered slightly, but the content. The actual love does not change. Okay? All right, thank you. I'm going to share a couple of announcements um, just briefly. First, um, a few books were donated. Um, I'll share that in just a sec. But shh, in a nutshell, the crystal bed sessions are available. You can do the crystal bed. It's in the uh, healing room out here. Um, just, you know, you learn more about it, you can ask the staff, the admins will help you, or Dosi in the bookstore. Um, they'll tell you more about it, but the crystal bed sessions are pretty extraordinary, honestly. Um, on social media, like us and click us and do whatever you gotta do online to you know spread the word. And some people are asking, um, which I've shared before, but we have a whole catalog of videos, hundreds from all these Sundays and from some workshops found for almost all of them are free on YouTube. Unfortunately, YouTube decided to monetize our station and they started forcing um, ads into ours, you know, and we still get people going, oh, you know, why did you start running ads? And they're getting all annoyed at us, which means you're trying to take us from a gifting relationship down to a karmic one. But we refuse to join you. Sink if you will, we're staying here. Um, and um, those gift sets over there, we just re-released a book um, called Sacred Sexuality. It's part of a set of three. They're in those purple um, wrap, tissue wrapped over there. It's three books. It's the relationships, creating fulfilling relationships, one called Introduction to Tantra and Sacred Sexuality, and the other one is a book, A Manual for Living Bliss. They're all in that package now, and that one's just been re-released, thank goodness. But you can get all three as a set. Some of you, you know, say, well, I already have one or two of those. You can get them anyway, and you can give them as a gift for that matter. But uh, you also save a bit, 10% uh, or 20%, I forget what, if you get those packages. But you're welcome, and it'd be great if you support us by getting those. Um, this afternoon, we have a workshop called The Three Gates of Love, Intimacy, and Passion. So it's on sacredness. It's on relationship with self, God, self, and others. I say this constantly and people's brains still go, he must mean partnership and I don't have one so it's not for me. That's not what I said. It's, it's for any understanding of sacred intimacy with God, self, and others. So we cover a lot and I can't easily advertise it and give you bullet points of what we're going to cover because I have no idea. Uh, other, th <laughs> you know, 
other than I know it's about this, um, the three gates, intimacy, love, intimacy, passion. Um, so we're going to talk about, but it depends on the group and the questions and where it goes, but absolutely wonderful for relations, partnerships, but also with self. But understanding, just like the talk today, I was talking about how I can't just do 3D conversations. So it's going to go to a deeper place to even understand that, that the shared breath is a symbol. The word kiss, as it was translated in ancient language, um, people think today it meant kiss, but it meant to share the same breath. So when you approach a person and you, you just hold space, you share intention, it's called a kiss, but you don't have to be kissing them to do it. When you share the same intention. But see, a kiss became a symbol of it, but then we lost the it and only went with the kiss. You know, who needs that? I get, I get the kiss. Wow. You know, and then the kiss became other things. So lots of doing. It's a great line in the Earth, Wind, and, song, the Earth, Wind, and Fire song. Um, Every thought is a dream rushing by in a stream, bringing life to the kingdom of doing. Meaning all of our consciousness ends up manifesting in our life. The kingdom of doing, meaning the manifested world. Uh, the song called Fantasy. So it's, it's an incredible thing to understand. Let's get back to this. Let's get back to a kiss of God. You know, the kiss with each other, the kiss with self, sharing the same intention, the same breath. And if you go in the direction of intimacy and so on, great. But can you keep the connection while doing what you do in your life? So there's that. And lastly, keep in mind that we have the eight weeks from today, um, the Daughters of Heaven conference. That's an extraordinary experience. It really is. Uh, it's a new book, The Daughters of Heaven. Um, we won't go into the, the roots of all that and the origins of all that, but the book's available in the bookstore, okay? But consider that um, and the conference. Um, very, very beautiful. We have great musicians, great things planned, and you're welcome to join us. Um, it's two days, eight weeks from now. All right? The last thing I want to say, which we can stream around the world, but I want to thank the person Gina Moore, Gina Renee Moore, um, she gifted us a few books, but it's Fiona and the Butterfly, Fiona the Butterfly, and it finds her light. So these are, um, I, we have a few samples she gifted us. So if you have a child or a grandchild, we only have a few, but if you have a child or a grandchild, raise a hand and we'll hand these. You can have one. Come on up. Um, let me, make, yeah, one there and one behind you. There's one for you. Give one way over there, please. There you go. Thank you. And if you didn't get one, you can still get it online. Fiona the Butterfly. All right, please stand for a closing prayer. Our workshop's going to start in about a half an hour, so you have time for munchies or whatever, especially if you go to Domino's. Um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, centering, please. Just feeling the appreciation of what was shared. The laughter, the friendships, the meditation, the healing, the requests given. Oh, love. Back to love, back to Eden. The light of God surrounds us. We are the light of God. The love of God enfolds us. The power of God protects us. We are the power of God. The presence of God watches over us. We are the presence of God. Wherever we go, God, God is, I am, we are, and so it is. Thank you and peace be with you.